with Simon Paley at Lauti's Collingwood. It is a double O gauge exhibition end-to-end -end, uh, modern image layout set somewhere between 2003 and 2018 and set on the south coast, Fairham specifically, but a fictionalised version of that area. Why did you settle on Fairham? Yeah. Fairham was, it originally started when I became a track apprentice with Nail Crail about 10 years ago. Uh, I was based, the, the whole programme was based at HMS Collingwood in, in Fairham and I used to travel on weekends from Fairham back to my parents and it struck me that what a good layout Fairham might be and it's just gone from there really. It came pretty much from all the things you'd want in a model railway in that at one end there's a tunnel, so good scenic break. At the other end, actually around this area, there is a very tight 90 degree bend, which would make it great for a home now and it wouldn't be unrealistic. And it's got some interesting double junctions, a stone terminal, a very unusual centre bay platform. And of course you, you do get a lot of interesting stock because you're so close to Southampton, Eastleigh, Portsmouth, you get a lot on diversions. There's one thing I remember reading on the layout topic which was you mentioned about the sharp curve at the yes. end of the station and your original plan was to have an L-shaped? Yes, so, so originally it was going to be L-shaped towards the um, audience but then that's not the best for an exhibition manager. So then it was going to be a sort of a hook walking stick shape, but I realised it was just going to be too difficult to uh, lay the curves that tight and get a nice um, scenic area, whereas a, a nice straight bridge was going to be a lot easier. How much compression did you have to do from the real phone? It, it's a lot. It's a lot of compression. So the um, the station, the platforms are about half the length they should be. Right. Then the area between the double junction and the tunnel at the single line is in reality, I think is about half a mile. Here it's about three coaches. So it's a lot of compression. Um, the only bits that is not as per the prototype in terms of track work is I'm missing a crossover in the junction. And of course, the yard is, is totally different because I just didn't have enough space to put in the full run round loop. So speak, speaking of space, how big is the layout itself? So scenically, it is 18 foot by 2 foot. Um, but with the foot yards attached, it's 28 foot by 2, by two foot. We can fit it into a medium transit. We tend to go for a large one just for ease because it's quite a squeeze in a, in a medium one. So the signalling is, say, fully prototypical. It is based off a computer program called JMRI, Java Model Area Interface, which is a free program which you can download. It's designed primarily for layout automation, but it does do a lot of signalling elements. Even though I didn't use any of those, I created my own logic it's got its own program which allows you to create your own logic statements. So the signalling is working off a computer, but its logic is based off a root relay interlocking at Fairham. Very complicated. It is very, it is very <laughs> complicated. There is about, I think the last count, 300 A4 pages of, of logic statements. Well, wow. I've had to code up. The primary reason I did it was one to prove to myself that I could do the interlocking yeah. system because yes I could do it at work but it's a bit dangerous if I get it wrong bad things will happen and I'm lucky in general that I could simulate the layout without building it mm. so I did all that first made sure the signaling element worked 
Because in my mind, if it didn't work, there's no point building the rest of the layout. It's something you can't really retrofit. You have to think about it when you're building a layout. To do the logic, I was actually using typical circuits from a training course. It's all based off my training course notes, modified for what the, the actual signal on the layout is, but it is all just training notes. The, the signaling is based on, on failure. With, with modifications to what I've changed, but all the signals are roughly fair. And there's a couple which are, are different, but that's because the, I've had to change the operations slightly. It's all based on, on what fair is actually like and how it works. Um, I'm lucky in, in my job that I can get access to all the control tables and wiring diagrams for fair so I can have that information at my fingertips. And I know lots of people will say to me, it's only a model railway, you don't need a full signaling system. I say, no, you don't, but actually now models are costing a lot of money, not to crash them together helps. Yeah. So actually you get a little bit of protection of your own models. Yeah, I haven't really thought about it that way. You think of yeah. signalling in modern railway terms... As just an aesthetic just, thing. Yeah, exactly. You don't think of it as a functional yeah. device. Yeah, well. and, and of course, you get the smoothness of, of the operation. A lot of layouts which have no interlocking, there's a lot of stop-start, is that point set, isn't it set? Then you run it and shorts and... So you do get a much smoother operation. So a real-world benefit to using a real-world system yeah. on the model railway. Yes, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say to anybody that you should go to the level I've done. <laughs> um, I've realised it's a stupid idea. But some level of, of signalling system is of benefit. Mm. That's really interesting. And you learn something new about doing it as well. Crossing was, was there for quite a period. So when I moved, changed the design to have the hook shape, it was there, but it's moved in a different place. And actually, it's because I've always wanted to do a level crossing. They're interesting, a little bit of you know, lights and sounds, and from a signaling point of view, they really interesting, but actually incredibly complex. There's a lot, a lot of interlocking that has to, and a lot yes. of processes before you get to yes, you know, yeah. the actual gates closing or opening that yes. you have to yeah. go through morphotically before. And and actually, the crossing which is modelled is a, a a fairly rare type of level crossing, which means I don't have to do a lot of signalling logic to make it work. If it was a normal level crossing, which ninety percent of people will see on their daily life it would be a lot more complex and I probably wouldn't do it, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> Not even after having written the preemption pages? Yeah. Oh, I think it would probably add another 100 pages of logic onto it. Really? Easily, yeah. Wow. They stay closed most of the time unless a user wants to... Yeah, it, it's, what's, it. it's what is called a manually controlled barrier crossing on demand. So it's normally closed to road traffic it's used on lines where the amount of rail traffic far outweighs the amount of road traffic. So anybody who wants to cross the railway asks for the, the crossing to be opened. I, th I think there's only about six in the country, really? if that. Um, but there is, in terms of from a signalling engineering point of view, it's a lot simpler crossing. And actually I realised that on an exhibition layout, it would provide a modicum of interaction with the public. And also you've got the layout set at quite a low height, which means, yes. you know, children can easily run up and, you know, yes. they see a giant illuminating sign saying yes. push, you know. Yeah, yeah. I have also incorporated a, a timeout thing that it's not going off every, every time a kid pushes it. <laughs> so it only goes off once every 10 minutes. Um, because I'm sure my fellow exhibitors would not like me if the barriers were going up and down all day with that yodel <laughs> alarm. Um, 
I don't think I would survive it, let alone uh, no. <laughs> anybody <laughs> sat next to it. Um, yeah. No, I think that's a really nice feature. Anything you can do to get kids, especially kids interested in, yes. in the hobby is yeah. worth doing. Yes. Really. Yeah. And especially when it ties into your interest of signaling yeah. and the opportunities that provides in terms yeah. of yeah. adding just more interest in general. Yeah, because my, 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 my philosophy <laughs> of the layout is to teach people about modern signaling. Both your normal enthusiast and your newcomer, general public. Yeah. Because we've all been there, we've all sat on the station and gone and heard the thing, signaling failure. And I sort of want to teach people what that actually means and why there is signaling on the, on the railway. I don't want to sort of jinx things, but when um, at an exhibition, say something goes wrong and there's, yep. you know, quote unquote, signaling failure, yep. it's about an opportunity for you to sort of teach kids and people who are watching. Yes, I, I would like to, I, I've, I've even contemplated having a sort of fault panel out the front where people can choose the faults that are happening oh. and add that little bit of keep the operators on their toes and show how it works. But I don't know how that will work in reality. Yeah, we definitely need a timeout feature like the level crossing. Time timeout and, and <laughs> a lot of the faults of lamp failures, without somebody telling you exactly what's going on, you really wouldn't probably notice it. Right. So that sort of, that's sort of been left to the side at the moment. Has there been any sort of, I don't want to say, or I say dumbing down of, of the signaling in terms of, because obviously it would be very complicated in real life and there could be a whole heap of things that in scale form at an exhibition would add too much pressure or yes. something like that. Yes, the, the, the points in real life, they get detected, but on the model they don't. Right. Just to avoid that problem of if they don't fire all the way over, which is always no fault of any point motor in, in the model world, it doesn't stop the layout from running. As we said before, all, all the trains are based off ones which you would likely see in Fairmont. There are some trains which might seem implausible, but not impossible. That's a bit of the, the philosophy I'm working with on the layout. Obviously, there are some trains which I have to substitute until somebody makes an electro style or, or something southern, modern southern. But I make sure I run them in a way that seems prototypical. I, I do have a sequence on the layout and it's taken from the passenger timetable and then build in freight. That will link in time to the signaling screen and that will have proper train describers, um, head codes working through the layout. How many people does it take to run the layout at an exhibition typically? We can run it with two people, because there is an automated system to make the signaling work, but we generally take three, so a driver at each end, slash for the odd operator, and a signaling come yard person, and then we generally take a fourth for spare. And I was, remember reading that you always like to have someone up front just to answer yeah. questions. Yes, and... we, try, we try to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, if you see it as an exhibition, you're more than welcome to, to put your head over the, the power pit and, <laughs> and ask any question you, you would like. You might, you might get an answer, you might get a funny answer. Something will happen. Something will happen. So I'm going to have to talk about the building, the station building. Yeah, we better, we, better, we better talk about the building, yes. <laughs> the station building is based on the Fairham building. There are some modifications to it, but primarily for ease of building it. And that um, was done by a very good friend of mine, mentor, Mr Southern Railway, Graham Muspratt, who 
he was happy to take on the task of scratch building it because I tried and I couldn't cut a single window even near square. So he was very kind to um, build the station building for me and he's done a wonderful job. Yeah, a lovely building. Um, yes. All hipped roofs as well. So. Yes, yeah, He, I think he cursed me after um, building that because, uh, yeah, the maths and angles involved in those hip roofs, I think, challenged him quite a bit. Have they all got uh, detailed interiors? Yes, all, all the buildings have got um, fully detailed, well, fully detailed interior, mostly from HO scale components from Faller and Knock, because actually the one thing I found building this layout was how poorly double O is served. Uh, for instance, the, the, the island platforms buildings, I could only scratch build those because I could not find a basic brick built island platform building. Right. Even in the modern laser cut kits, I couldn't find anything. Yeah. My, my favourite building on the layout is the, the signalling centre. The, the story behind the layout is that there is currently a re-signalling project going on in the area and that's just a temporary signaling centre whilst whilst they are doing the work yeah and that fitted quite I've always wanted to do a a, a full signaling centre interior with all the interlockings and stuff and I found that that worked really well yeah and it had a good nod to what you do yes yeah. So. yeah so you've got a lot of line side detailing um, on the layout this it's everywhere. Yeah. How did, why did you want to include it and how did you go about doing it? The decision to include it was, was not just because, again, it's the teaching people about modern signaling. There's also, there are a lot of layouts where people focus on the accuracy of the buildings, the trains, even the cars, but they don't tend to think about the infrastructure detailing, apart from possibly point motors and stuff like that, and maybe some of the four foot equipment. That was the reason I wanted to include so much detail, was to bring the whole package together. And most of the 3D printed details are, as you say, are not available um, commercially from, from your standard manufacturers. So I've done almost all the details are 3D printed to my own designs. I think I was almost going to mention about um, track cleaning, how difficult that must be. Oh, extreme, it's very, <laughs> very, it's quite difficult track cleaning, very difficult track cleaning. Um, yeah, so I've, I've had to cut track rubbers into specific shapes to, to only clean the rails. Um, never, never fit third rail to allow if you want to be able to easily clean your track. It's my top tip. <laughs> A few future plans with the layout. It's it's scenically finished. Of course, you can never say a layout is fully finished. But the major plans are to you introduce an RFID system onto the layout, so I can have that automatic train describer head code. We are currently looking at a way of making the for the yards more efficient. We don't know whether that's going to be traversal or a um, roundy roundy traditional for the art. But those are the two major developments. The, the problem I have is that whilst I do have a fantastic operating crew, they are shared along a number of layouts and increasingly the age is getting in and exhibitions are long weekends. So I'm looking for younger members of, of the modeling community who are happy to come and uh, spend a weekend away playing trains and dealing with a nerd about signalling. <laughs> so anybody who would like to come and help, always welcome. How can they contact you? You can contact me either through Iron Web, St Simon and Iron Web, or 
contact me through my blog, which is modelrailwaysigling.blog.
Yeah, thank you. 37401. Yep. Yeah.